I'm going to start with a couple of anecdotal examples and a warning that I shifted my title. I'll show you the change in a minute, but let me just tell you these um, anecdotes first up um, to set the context for why I changed my title. In 2009, a seasoned Greenpeace campaigner from Sydney left behind 14 years of campaigning and advocacy to found a solar energy startup company. Once he'd set it up, he linked the business to major environmental advocacy groups and paid them $500 for each new customer they referred. This raised substantial sums for these NGOs at the same time as expanding his new company. He even created a dual website with the company name suffixed by .com for the business side and .org for the, um, the advocacy NGO side. Around the same time, a well-known Sydney designer who had founded a successful startup design company founded another website with the suffix .do, www.good.do, providing online resources for supporting activists and campaigners, and also set up a partnership with a number of Sydney local councils called the Compost Revolution. And this partnership combines food recycling education, both online and community-based, government subsidies of infrastructure, um, in compost bins and worm farm equipment, and contracting out arrangements to private providers. So the point of these two examples is that they have in common novel blends of both social activism and social enterprise. And in this paper, I aim first of all to persuade you that hybrid initiatives drawing on elements of both social activism and social enterprise are increasingly important and interesting channels for responding to the challenge of climate change. They're attracting both popular and scholarly commentary that reflects this hybridity. I'll refer briefly to some literature, but we see a bifurcation between literature from social movements uh, addressing these topics and literature from management and business. But so far, no one's paid all that much attention to the role and salience of law in these initiatives and projects. And so the second aim of my paper is to draw attention to a constructive tension between different images of the role of law in relation to such initiatives and to sketch out the early outlines of a productive way forward to research this. So I want to say that this paper is part of a larger project exploring the short version of it is socio-legal support structures for organizations responding to climate change. And it's the subject of my future fellowship, which I recently arrived here to start. And this is a very early stage reflective think piece. And in the spirit of that, I have already shifted the title from now. This, uh, so I, I sent you all an abstract saying responding to climate change at the intersection of social activism and social enterprise. And I'm now calling this law and the growth of grassroots innovation between social activism and social enterprise. And, and that signals two things. First of all, I'm no longer quite so confident of this precise intersection of the two. I think I spoke in the abstract about outlining the typologies of these hybrid initiatives, the dimensions that link them. And I've really had some challenges doing that, and I think that's been an interesting learning exercise um, that teaches me exactly what is actually exciting about them and I hope I'll be able to convey that. So we have a, a more fuzzy zone between social enterprise and social activism rather than a precise intersection. And I've also taken out the phrase responding to climate change. And again, you'll see why part of what I'm talking about and one of the sort of primary set of examples of these hybrid initiatives uh, that I think are an important piece of the puzzle of responding to climate change nonetheless take us outside of a green wrapper. Um, they're not wrapped in green. And again, I think this is exciting and important, but it presents some real challenges for defining the scope of my research to come in, um, in viable ways, and I'm still grappling with those. Um, so for all of those reasons, having changed the title, I've now decided after this to just speak directly to you and not use slides. Um, although I have one or two tables I might bring up that, from other people that are useful in part for delineating what I'm interested in. But they don't entirely work, so I hope that I'll be sort of unfolding a narrative rather than a set of headings in what comes. So there's two main portions. I'll spend about half of the time on describing the kinds of initiatives and projects that I'm interested in and discussing some of the challenges I've had in uh, analyzing their dimensions, as I said. 
and summarizing the existing literature, which, as I say, bifurcates along activism and enterprise. And then I'll turn to the um, question of how law can be brought into the picture and start with a dichotomous presentation of two very different angles on the role of law and then complicate that dichotomy by stressing ambiguities in each of the literatures which tends to prioritize one role. Um, and that di ambiguity, I'm arguing, constructs a constitutive relationship between the contrasting images of law, which I think is very fertile for the research agenda taking it forward. And I'm just going to point to three threads of contested framing around law in, in relation to these hybrids initiatives um, around the issues of profit, harm, and the rule of law. So that's in the second, second section. And then I'll just conclude by really just pointing very briefly um, to what I plan to do empirically and gesture towards the kinds of theoretical resources I plan to draw upon. So, um, so the first main half is about the zone between social activism and social enterprise. Um, as I mentioned in the abstract which I sent around, there's a real growing interest in environmentally responsive social enterprise and a reignited focus on social movements in relation to climate change in different literatures, but they do tend to occur as very different strands of scholarship. The social enterprise studies typically relate more to business and management, although corporate social responsibility strands of research take that in a slightly different direction. But social movement literature grows out of political mobilization research and is much more interested in politically motivated social change. But as I say, I think there are activities taking place in increasingly hybrid sites and that this is part of what the Green Alliance in the UK about five years ago signalled. They had a paper called The New Green Politics. Um, and they argued that there were three shifts in green politics occurring, um, which were important. And I think all three of these shifts are really crucial to this hybrid zone between social enterprise and social activism. The first shift is that advocacy focused on government by those responding to environmental change politics is increasingly supplemented or even displaced by social mobilization focused on communities. The second aspect of the new green politics is that an emphasis on social goals is augmenting the narrower focus on environmental goals. And the third is that a largely instrumental preoccupation with institutional design is increasingly supplemented by an insistence on the importance of values and identities. And I'll come back to all three of those as I speak. Um, but essentially, I think that the developments in this hybrid zone illustrate these shifts. And we see this from a number of angles. I'm going to just articulate what that zone might be through a sense of definitions, um, and then through some actual concrete examples, and then explain some of the difficulties I had with conceptualizing the dimensions of that intersection. So, just in terms of broad language, we can see, for example, that there's a literature in something called Transitions uh, Management, which talks about community-based grassroots innovation. And that is a phrase, I think, that captures the kind of hybrid activity. Innovation is typically studied in the sense of scaling up niche activity uh, to mainstream markets. But the community-based activism and the grassroots aspect of it signal that there's a different kind of texture to the activities that are going on. Now, when we get to discussions of social enterprise, um, there's a much more, uh, there's a pretty standard definition of social enterprise that circulates amongst government policy, and there is a huge and growing literature on social enterprise. But the emphasis here is on the blend of trading and social and environmental mission. Now, I didn't want to go into a great deal of detail on definitions, because I think in the abstract it's not going to take us too far. But let me just read out two composite de definitions of social enterprise and social activism um, that might be useful. Just focus on momentarily. The social enterprise, typically defined as organizations that trade to fulfill their mission and reinvest the majority of their surplus or profit in fulfillment of an environmental or social purpose. Now, we might say, by contrast, that social activists organize collective political mobilization also to fulfill an environmental or social purpose, 
but I would add usually on behalf of a group or cause that is neglected or disadvantaged by existing power relations. Now, if we define them in contrast like that, there are a couple of contrasts. One is obviously the emphasis on trading or the use of a business model in enterprise and not in activism. Um, and a second contrast is the focus on shifting existing power relations in activism and less of an emphasis on that with social enterprise, which leads, I think, to a third implicit contrast, which isn't explicit, and I think is challenged by the initiatives that I'm interested in studying, which is the idea that activism is confrontational, um, whereas enterprise activities, however much they're trying to start a new, if you like, open up a new market, are nonetheless working, broadly speaking, with the grain of existing political and especially economic arrangements. Um, I think that in the initiatives, the hybrid initiatives in this zone between activism and enterprise that I'm interested in, um, that all of these contrasts uh, are challenged, although the centrality of the profit motive, which is a large aspect of sort of detailed literature on social enterprise definitions, how much should redistribution of profit or surplus actually, should there be actual quantitative limits on defining what constitutes a social enterprise and so on. This is what I don't want to go down uh, the path too far into that. But that contestation around the centrality of the role of profit um, does not dissolve in this hybrid zone. But the contrast between political and economic means does dissolve. And this issue of one being confrontational and the other working with the grain of existing status quo also dissolves. And we'll see how that happens with some specific examples. So I want, I want now actually to just, in a sense, give a list of the kinds of initiatives um, that I think exist in the hybrid zone uh, so that you know uh, roughly more concretely what I might be talking about. Um, There are a couple of ways this could be done. One is to do it sectorally, and just to describe um, sectoral responses uh, that mix elements of activism and enterprise. And the other is to point to some cross-cutting developments which you might organize more along the ideas of production and consumption, and even by place. So let me explain what I mean. If we looked at sectors, um, the kinds of initiatives that I view as central to uh, this exploration could exist in transport and here an example might be car share schemes um, and I'll come back to car sharing um, as a thread as I, as I can, can, can continue to talk. Um, it might be in the area of housing for example eco-housing or as a scheme called Green Strata which is attempting to assist people living in strata buildings to live in a, in a greener way could be in the areas of food, where we look at community gardens um, and community-supported agriculture box schemes like Food Connect. Could be in the area of energy, which could include distributed solar and wind generation, or the various wind cooperative renewable energy projects that are increasingly growing in Australia as elsewhere. But if we move away from a sectoral sense of what these kinds of initiatives might be, there are cross-cutting developments in the areas of consumption, production, and place-based localism, if you like, that I think capture this spirit of combining aspects of activism and enterprise as well. So in consumption, there's this now increasingly referred to as collaborative consumption set of activities, largely using the internet and the web as a platform for allowing people to essentially share access to resources. And this occurs across a range of uh, areas, barter, reuse, working space, um, land, food, lending tools, um, even borrowing money. Um, so now we start to see how this is immediately pushing beyond what might look obviously green, but I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. If we look not at consumption but at production, in many ways perhaps the original blend of activism and enterprise has to do with the, the unions um, who were always focused on collective representation of workers, obviously in one sense 
relating to jobs and enterprise, but in another to create a political identity that would shift the status quo of power relations between labor and capital. And there's initiatives like the Earth Worker Cooperative, which is a recent initiative trying to get off the ground in Victoria, uh, creating a cooperative entity to foster green jobs. Um, and then there are also phys physical communities that host a range of productive activities on site, which are organized often on a quasi-market basis. So there's um, a place called South Melbourne Commons, which is set up by Friends of the Earth in Melbourne, again, to provide a range of services on site with the umbrella vision of creating a more sustainable way of life, even though not each of the specific activities within the building might necessarily be classified as green. And then even more broadly, you have locality-based initiatives like transition towns and transition neighborhoods that generate a range of novel practices in different areas of everyday life that all gathered under the banner of responding to the twin challenges of peak oil and climate change. Um, so as you can see, this is an enormously broad array of activities. But let me just give you an example of if you organize them on a spectrum from social in activism to social enterprise, and we went back to car sharing, which I mentioned at the start, um, I would suggest that you could put them along an array which might look idiosyncratic, and I will be really interested in your response to whether uh, this is a helpful way to make sense of a range of, of activities. But if you think about, in a sense, the practice of automobility rather than transport as a sector, um, the most extreme end of the social activism spectrum, in many ways, is something like the road building protests, um, which in the UK were always a, a very central aspect of green radical environmentalism. I think possibly less so here. But we then move across to something like NGO lobbying for tr public transport, which is still in the zone of activism, but not as contested or confrontational as the first example. And then peer-to-peer -peer car sharing schemes, which are almost community-based grassroots innovation, where you can share cars um, on web-based platforms between ordinary individuals within your neighborhood. Um, and then again, moving across to the more enterprise end of the spectrum, a car sharing social enterprise, or a car sharing for profit enterprise, and there are interesting debates about what's the actual difference on the ground between those two, um, especially where they have the same legal form. Um, and then across to something like a multinational car rental company with a corporate social responsibility policy, which might be all the way across to the spectrum of social enterprise. So my argument is that viewing things on the spectrum between activism and enterprise actually will lead us in interesting ways into discussions about the role of law. Um, but I, I just want to make two points before I move to that section about the spectrum. And first is this, this point that I've already mentioned in passing, that they, they're pushing beyond the boundaries of what might be called the green wrapper. Um, the second point is also that it's actually often difficult to classify them in sectoral terms. So it would be very odd in some ways to look at road building protests as part of the policy sector of transport. But that is, in a sense, what precisely the spectrum is, is aiming at doing, is, is linking up different types of activities from a fresh perspective. Um, I think these two aspects are related. Um, and the issue of activities that don't look green initially, but that nonetheless might be very important for responding to climate change, is really, I think, because especially the elements that are more enterprise-based, but even the activism side of things, in some ways, it's about new models of consumption, production, and exchange, rather than about greening the economy using the current model of consumption, production, and exchange. And where you, talk, where you look at the enterprise form of those activities, people often talk about business models. Um, now, in the language of activism, they're less likely to talk about a new business model, although I will come back to that, because that um, exists too. But the point is that, that precisely by going beyond the green wrapper, they challenge our sense of how we divide the economy into professional policy sectors that each of you know, specialized groups focus on and aim to influence the shape of. 
Um, and they really, I, I mean, I think a separate paper could be written about the ways in which um, economic model of access to services and goods rather than ownership um, could significantly change resource use. But car sharing, just to keep going with this thread, claims that it takes 10 to 15 cars off the street for each car provided. Um, and some car sharing companies do focus very strongly on the environmental benefits of their services. Um, but many do not. And I think that some of what is going on in moving beyond the green wrapper, if you like, is a systemic change in the structure of consumption, production, and exchange that in many ways is underpinned by at least two of those three shifts in the new green politics I mentioned. The fact that environmental goals are now widened to include social goals first, and the, the change from a focus on state institutions to more of a focus on business and civil society, secondly. Um, and there's a recent argument made in the so-called blogosphere that there's a natural coalition between the green economy and the sharing economy, and that such a joining, particularly if it, there's a strong focus on including disadvantaged and poorer communities, will really be the only way that the green economy could become a mass movement and really secure the kind of take-up needed to shift everyday practices enough to respond properly to climate change. Now, that's my second point in a sense about the spectrum, is that when I tried to grapple with the challenges of what were the dimensions of the spectrum in a more conceptual way, and I was originally working with tables, which I would have hoped to have up on the PowerPoint for you, but it just, they didn't work. I tried to work with dichotomies between states and markets, between public and private, between individual and collective, and between protest and compliance, as I mentioned earlier. But there was too much of a structural shift going on, and I think that that organization of the change along those lines doesn't work in a neat way. And I still don't know what the answer to the dimensions of it is in precise terms, except to say, first of all, that the degree to which arranging organizations, activities around profit still becomes very important, and I'll come back to that in talking about law. And secondly, that actually what this is about is about building alternative systems of provision, which then engage people in altered everyday practices. And it's the sort of everyday practices of living that are the target of change. And if there is an attempt to open up a new market or change a particular policy or a, a state law, it's incidental to the, the, the sort of the deeper aim of, if you like, a kind of almost cultural shift in changing everyday practices. Um, and I think part of that idea that there's a cultural shift is what's behind the proliferation of umbrella labels for some of these initiatives such as collaborative consumption or a sharing economy, um, which I'll come back to um, when I'm talking about the role of law in relation to this. And we see those umbrella labels um, popping up in a way that indicates that it's, it, there is a sort of identity shift going on underneath these structural changes. So I did mention that there is an existing literature on these initiatives. I don't want to spend too much time on that, um, but because my main point about that really is just that almost none of it addresses the role of law. I'm going to pull on two, uh, art, well, an article and a book which, which look very directly at the role of law um, in a minute. But other than that, we see um, a burgeoning literature, especially in human geography, really, about the hybrid zone. There is otherwise quite a bifurcated literature where social enterprise has become a, a large focus of management studies. Um, and this transition management literature I, I mentioned earlier, which is a sort of interdisciplinary sustainability literature, but it often focuses on the governance of economic processes and the way in which it can mainstream niche green activities into more um, mass pr practices, if you like. The political scientists are somewhat interested, um, and they have typically emphasized the political activism side of things or the emergent collective identities embodied in such initiatives, but then tend not to address the enterprise and economic governance side of things. Human geographers are somewhat more eclectic and seem to be especially interested in the, the cross-cutting initiatives like transition towns, 
But even within human geography, you do see people either taking a social movements approach or um, a sort of transitions management approach, which is more focused on niche enterprises scaling up. So again, you get this kind of bifurcation between different angles that I think generally re is reflected in the literature um, in this area. And I want to go into the role of law by taking that bifurcation as a starting point, if you like, and then working towards the ambiguities I spoke of earlier. So I'm turning now to what, at a very general level, initially might be some conceptualization of the role of law in relation to these hybrid initiatives that blend elements of activism and enterprise. And after articulating that at a general level, I'm going to give you some examples of how some of these initiatives have actually been bumping up against specific legal roadblocks just um, to indicate some of the ways in which the contested framing of law actually is happening on the ground um, as a starting point for how I might research this. So, um, so I'm going to make a very schematic proposal about the role of law, is to try and think what would be its role in this hybrid zone to start with what the role of law might look like from the ends of the spectrum between social movements and social enterprise. And to suggest that law appears in two very different guises from those two perspectives, or focal senses, if you like. Now, I'm, this is obviously somewhat simplified, but I think it's, it's a useful starting point, and I'll use one example publication for each focal sense, just to illustrate what I mean. From the perspective of social movements, Law is often the direct target of social change, and its content embodies collective social identity. So negatively, laws that are viewed as harming society or embodying injustice are the target of change. Or positively, new laws are promoted, but they're promoted because they would express a better collective sense of what society wants to achieve. But from both angles, the focal image of law is one of command, prohibition, or a directive that aims to prevent or compensate harm. It's a kind of regulatory image of law, if you like. And in literature on the law and social movements, important test cases and strategic class action litigation often are central to the inquiry, and courts appear as a forum for challenge and protest against existing legal situations. So it's a focal image of law that's connected, if we use the trilogy of Albert Hirschman's of Exit, voice and loyalty. This is law's voice, if you like. And I think there's a recent article in Law and Society Review which, which beautifully illustrates that. Lisa Van Hala has uh, explored the legal opportunity structures for the UK environmental movement. And uh, her database consists of judicial review actions against the state. And her interest is when and why NGOs turn to litigation and courts. And the types of laws that she looks at include state authorizations for genetically modified crops, or the licensing of nuclear waste sites, or government failure to implement energy conservation legislation, just to give a few examples um, that illustrate this regulatory focal image of law um, as an expression in, in one sense of voice um, that I think is how law appears from the perspective of social movements. From the perspective of social enterprise, by contrast, law is an indirect enabler of exchange relations, more facilitative than regulatory. And even where it is regulatory, it's focused on either constructing a framework of incentives for economic activity or on constituting the skeleton of legal personality um, as a precondition for an organization going on to choose its activities and trade in the market. Now, there isn't much of a literature on law and social enterprise as such, but there's, where it, there is, it focuses on the different legal models for debt business ent entities. So you get discussions of comparative efficacy of cooperative models or um, accreditation models like the B Corp certification model for social, um, socially responsible companies and so on. Community interest companies, a new legal form that the UK introduced some years ago, is a particular focus in this area. And this facilitative image of law comes up very strongly, albeit implicitly, because it's not explicitly about law, 
In a recent report on climate change motivated social enterprise in Australia, which UTS carried out, called Green Chrysalis, um, and it looked at the responses by small and medium sized enterprises to the low carbon economy. Um, incidentally, I think it's interesting that they too moved away from the green wrapper in doing this, and they explicitly said they're not looking at enterprises with carbon reduction as their core business, but at enterprises who faced an, a new range of risks and opportunities from a low carbon economy. Um, and to the extent that law comes into it, it comes in as facilitative. Sometimes they talk about substantive support like green purchasing policies, but the, the umbrella framing of it is the legal framework needed to support and enable SMEs to capitalize on the opportunities of a low carbon economy. So again, a much, a, in some ways you might say the Green Chrysalis Report exemplifies more of the, the new green politics focused on business and social goals and the Van Hala article, the old green politics focusing on the traditional state institutions and the green goals. So that would be my starting point for illustrating the role of law at a very general level. But now I want to complicate that simplistic dichotomy um, and talk about the ways in which ambiguities in each of the literature actually pick up on the image from the opposite end of the spectrum. So I'll do this from two angles. And this is where I have the two articles that do address law as illustrative of what I mean. Um, from the angle of social, law and social movements, the key point is that despite the contrast I've just painted, there are important ways in which law appears in the context of social movement as a framework of incentives. Van Hala's article is actually focused on legal opportunity structures, a phrase which itself could be read as a close analogy to a framework of incentives. And when law becomes the instrument as well as the target of social change, activism becomes read in terms of a set of rational actors responding to market failure. And there are the resource mobilization literature on social movements in many ways does treat collective action as a market failure pro problem. Um, not only as that, but there is that dimension to the problem. And it is, in, I think, striking that market-like strategies have increasing purchase in the world of political lobbying and advocacy and activism. Um, and there's a significant rise, for example, of social marketing techniques in campaigning and advocacy, and marketing departments are increasingly writing about this in their journals. Um, but the, uh, the article I want to refer to briefly, because it is one of the rare references directly to law, is by Graham Smith and Simon Teasdale in a recent 2012 issue of Economy and Society. Um, and it's about the, the legal and regulatory conditions that would need to be in place to support a transition towards associative democracy. So they draw on Paul Hurst's vision of associative democracy um, as a political vision of sort of small scale distributed collective action um, that moves away from centralized state control. And they discuss where the social enterprise would be the legal model that would take this vision forward. Um, and in a sense, the vision of associative democracy that animates their paper has a more natural resonance with social activism, but then the paper quickly moves to exploring the legal aspects of entity formation in detail. I have to say, I was actually on the editorial um, committee that reviewed this paper, and there was enormous debate about whether the two halves made any coherent sense. So um, if you're interested to, to there was the, it was contentious as to whether these two things could be brought together in, in a productive way, but obviously decided it was. Um, so their questions began with activism, but brought in forms of enterprise as crucial to their answer. And the constitutive nature of the two is very clear in the article, but it's also a great challenge, because as they note in the article, um, trying to embed democracy internally within economic entities cuts against the grain of facilities of law. Now, they don't frame it in those terms, but I think they run up against the problem that law is fundamentally permissive in this area rather than regulatory. And so within organizations, it's very rare for law to actually require democratic participation. And then they try and imagine some permissive legal structures like a purchasing procurement law that might give preferences for associations with highly democratic internal structures, but note that this would probably run up against procurement law exists, that exists 
that is premised on very different uh, issues, usually of best value or even just of the cheapest price and it would probably be illegal to give such preferences. Um, so as they argue, exit rather than voice ends up being the reigning principle in this area. But they do make this attempt to bring the two together. From the opposite angle of social enterprise, um, and this takes us very much back to the third point of the new green politics about cultural identity. I think there are interesting ways in which law is appearing in the context of social enterprise as the expression of a new collective identity um, and one which is actually changing mainstream ways of running the economy in many ways. There's a general sense of fresh identity that's very palpable in the field of social enterprise generally, so much so that some of the critical commentaries speaking wearily of the messianic identity pervading particularly the grey literature. Um, and there is a sort of wealth of blogs and, and debates and discussions around collaborative consumption um, that reflect that excitement at, at, at some sense of, of a new way of doing things, of consuming and producing. Um, and perhaps most relevant for law, this all comes out in a very interesting book by a woman called Janelle Orsi, um, just published by the American Bar Association, called Practicing Law in the Sharing Economy. And this is a practitioner's book, um, but it has a couple of introductory chapters where she explicitly argues that law can be reconstituted and reimagined in the context of a sharing economy. I'll just read you out one passage. Um, to most law students and lawyers, practicing transactional law is not an obvious path to saving the world. But as the world's economic and ecological meltdowns demand that we redesign our livelihoods, our enterprises, our food system, housing, and much more, transactional lawyers are needed en masse to aid in an epic reinvention of our economic system. This reinvention is referred to by many names, the sharing economy, the grassroots economy, the new economy. Sharing economy lawyers make the exploding numbers of social enterprises, cooperatives, urban farms, co-housing, there's a long list of examples of the kind of work she does. They make all of these unique organizations possible and legal. Now there's a, a, a great sort of flurry of activity around this. There are blogs and debates, as I said, and in March 2012, San Francisco, where she's based, established a sharing economy working group aimed at sort of exploring the policy changes that we needed to foster this, the growth of this. Um, and actually in Melbourne last November, there was a sharing economy launch um, and a call for a similar kind of working group to be established in Australia. I'm still working out exactly who that was by. I just found that very recently, so I don't know much detail there. But in, in a comment by um, David Bollier, who's written a lot on the Commons and concepts of the trust and how they can be worked into legal forms and, and legal policies on this issue, um, he has an article which he actually refers to this as a new development paradigm and comments that the shareable city, he says, is a more dramatic departure in development policy than the mayor of San Francisco actually lets on. Instead of pursuing strategies based on big taxpayer subsidies for big capital projects managed by political and corporate elites, the shareable city's vision aims at decentralized participation by ordinary citizens and neighborhood groups in conjunction with nimble, socially attuned startup businesses. Um, so this broad idea uh, is in a sense becoming a, a hook for a coalescing sense of cultural identity, which as I say, I think takes us back to that third aspect of the new green politics. And I think that just as that is emerging and gaining this umbrella uh, name of the sharing economy, or other people say the solidarity economy or the new economy, it's starting to bump up against legal roadblocks in, in very interesting ways. So I've got about, I think, five minutes um, just to give you a few examples of how that's happened, which are not organized in any conceptually systematic way. I just think they might provide interesting material for discussion. Um, one of those, now, this, one of the, the, the biggest legal debates at the moment about collaborative economy is a classic example of something that's not obviously a green issue, but Airbnb is a website that allows people to stay in other people's houses instead of hotels. Now, I do actually think you could do a very interesting systematic study of you know, the, the, 
resource, the ways in which that becomes a less resource intensive way to travel that would have significant green implications. Um, I obviously can't do that here. Um, but because the platform of collaborative consumption that Airbnb works on is, is modelled in other initiatives, it is an interesting example of the way in which law comes into this. And um, it's run into legal problems over the second... Well, I'm going to give you three examples um, of the contested framing which law attracts in these areas. And I was going to start with profit, but let me just give you the Airbnb example because it relates to harm, which is in many ways the standard regulatory issue. And it's in some ways perhaps not unexpected that it's run up against health and safety regulation about accommodation for offering accommodation to travellers. Is your house becoming a hotel and are you subject um, to health and safety regulation? And if you're not complying, you would then be an illegal transient hotel by participating in this. And they have actually, New York City has instituted a, a, a large lawsuit against a particular individual who was um, utilizing the site to buy up apartments and, and rent them out on a mass basis. So essentially using it as a business. Um, so actually there are interesting threads of both the idea that this person was making a profit was what attracted the legal hostility against him, as well as breaching the health and safety laws in a more standard regulatory story. Um, and the response of the company was, in many ways, as one commentator referred to, to um, try to turn it into a conversation which was about following the rules, but turning it into one about sad or struggling people just trying to get by. Um, so the idea that most people were not making this a business, of which profit was the main aim, was in a sense their defense. But the obvious regulatory issue of in, in providing services in a new way, if you cause potential harm to those who use them, the law must intervene, has come in quite directly there. Um, and as I say, there's a sort of tart debate online about whether or not, in fact, the site is facilitating a peer-to-peer -peer sharing economy rather than empowering a new breed of cold-blooded hospitality entrepreneurs. Um, and at the moment, I think the risks of running up against the regulatory laws that are aimed to prevent harm has been emphasised by what's happening in that area. Now, we could contrast that with what happened with car sharing, again, in, in a, this is in the United States, where the sort of litigation side of things seems to have taken off more rapidly. But peer-to-peer -peer car sharing schemes where you rented a car to a neighbour came up against, uh, once again, the potential harm problem of what happened if someone had an accident in the car and they were in it. And so there was a debate with insurance about how that would apply. Uh, with, the, with the opposite result, instead of being sued for illegally turning your private car into a rental business, um, the legislature, after a sequence of activities, actually passed a law legalising this and making it legitimate. And I think what's interesting about that law is that it quite explicitly takes the issue of profit as central to the legal definition of why this is an acceptable activity. Um, and although the provision is, is longer and in legalese, the essence of it is that the legal and regulatory framework that applies to a car rental business will not apply to an ordinary person renting a car out through this method, provided the car owner does not make more money than it costs to own their car. Um, so Orsi has a comment on this, that it's legally defined sharing as a way to offset costs in distinction to sharing as a way to make a profit. Um, and this could potentially be the basis of a wave of sharing laws that could expand that new economy, uh, which allows access and sharing of resources in a less carbon intensive way. Um, so that means that of course, accounting tricks could be brought in to um, respond to the legal definition of exactly what counts as profit and what doesn't. And, and there are also, in, in many ways, standard regulatory literature about creative compliance, for example, um, becomes relevant. And also the larger questions of to what degree does this issue of harm function as a smokescreen for actually protecting the market share of people who are renting cars in the traditional way in the mainstream economy and so private interest theories of regulation.
versus public interest and theory regulations um, are immediately brought into play. So I think, as you can see, this is a very broad palette. Um, I, uh, it's the essence of what I want to research. I, I'm still working out the precise way of defining a feasible scope for this, but I have several elements to that, which I'll just list in closing, and uh, would be happy to take comments on um, interesting ways of taking this forward. But I imagine certain four case studies that would represent the spectrum that I've spoken to you about today, but also to build on databases of a wider array of initiatives that seek to respond to climate change or to, to respond to the, to, to produce services that help people to reduce their carbon footprint. And there are two geographers in Australia who have built um, a data set of just such initiatives for a project on urban carbon governance that I'm hoping to build on. Um, and I also think there's a third area that's turning out to be potentially very fertile, which is there's certain legal professionals um, increasingly moving into this area, some of them as part of their private business and some as part of pro bono programs, like a, a particular venture between Mallison's and Social Venture Australia. Um, and to actually interview the legal professionals in this area, I think, is another fertile route into working out the dimensions of the spectrum and its relevance to responding to climate change. Thanks. Thank you.